As I enjoy some long overdue time off, I hope you're enjoying some of these Encore episodes. The following is an Encore presentation of episode 324 with Dr. B.J. Fogg. With tiny habits and more broadly even my work in behavior design, you get really good at figuring out what's the best behavior for me, and then how do I make it really easy, and then how do I make sure it happens? Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and professional growth. It is the Read to Lead podcast, where I believe that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in your life, then intentional and consistent reading is a must. I'm going to help you not only narrow that list, but bring you key insights and valuable ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. I'm especially excited today because we're going to be talking with the man who has written my favorite book so far of 2020. Okay, so technically it came out on December 31st of 2019, but who's counting? The author I'm talking about is Dr. B.J. Fogg, and the book is Tiny Habits, The Small Changes That Change Everything. Now, there have been a lot of books written about habit. There's Charles Duhigg's The Power of Habit. We've talked to James Clear right here on the show about his book, Atomic Habits. There's Brendan Burchard and High Performance Habits, and now Tiny Habits. What makes it for me my favorite book so far this year? When I finish a book and I realize I'm obsessed with the idea of taking the contents of the book and teaching it to people, writing a curriculum around it, if you will, I know that's a book that I got a ton out of. I'll be asking Dr. Fogg to share about things like how tiny can be transformative, his E equals MC squared level behavior model, how to use the model not just to create good habits, but adjust it to also end bad habits, and plenty more. Speaking of applying what's in a book like this, there are a number of free downloadable resources to go along with this book for those who have purchased it. I have downloaded all of those myself and have really enjoyed using them, leveraging them to do exactly that, to help me apply what's in the book. It's that kind of book. You are definitely not going to want to just read this and, and put it aside. This is a book that you can't read and not implement. Well, Dr. B.J. Fogg founded the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford University, and in addition to his research, he teaches industry innovators how human behavior really works. He created the Tiny Habits Academy to help people around the world, and he continues to do that. His new book is called Tiny Habits, The Small Changes That Change Everything, and I'm delighted to welcome him to the show. Uh, BJ, welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so happy to be here. Well, uh, let's begin uh, with the question of of why uh, tiny. I think some might say, well, how transformative can that be? Uh, What would you say to someone who says, you know, go big or, or go home? Well, I would say, has that worked for you in the past? (laughs) And if so, keep going. And if not, I have the answer, Mm. which is, I mean, the way you have the big transformations is by starting tiny because it's reliable. It's easy to start. It's easy to do and so on. So there's a process, as you saw in the book. And the way you reliably get to the big transformations is by starting tiny. The way you don't get there is by just somehow imagining you could make this dramatic change and it's going to work. And Mm. I think most people just have to look at their own life history and say, well, when has that worked for me? How often? Mm. How reliable? So now Tiny Habits is the best way to create new habits. It's the easiest way to create new habits. And it's super reliable. By reliable, I mean it works consistently. It's not hit or miss. It's very consistent. Just like if you wanted a wonderful, let's say, vegetable garden. You know that planting seeds in the earth doesn't give you the garden immediately, but Mm. if you plant them in the right spot, you will have an awesome garden. And that's how to think about your habits. Mm, I love that analogy. Well, let's talk about the process, uh, BJ. Talk, if you would, about the basics of, of the behavioral model. So in Tiny Habits, the book Tiny Habits, I present models. Models are ways of thinking about behavior and methods. Methods are ways of designing behavior. So models and methods. I had, I don't know how to characterize it. In 2007, pieces of the puzzle around how human behavior works Mm. landed in my lap. (laughs) You know, it took, it wasn't sudden, but over time, and it all came together for me in 2007. And I call it the fog behavior model. And it's related to tiny habits, but this came before tiny habits. This is, wow, Jeff, I'll say it, but people are going to be skeptical. 
what I'm going to share with you is the fundamental model for behavior, just like E equals MC squared is a fundamental model in physics. So it's, it's that important. And it goes like this. Behavior happens when three things come together at the same moment. There's motivation to do the behavior. There's ability to do the behavior. And there's a prompt for the behavior. Mm. Boom. And that's it. Those three things. It characterizes any behavior in any culture at any age. So it's a fundamental model. And the tiny habits method is derived from that model. Other companies, parents or other change experts, etc., uh, seem to rely, correct me if I'm wrong, predominantly on one aspect of that. And that's that's yeah. motivation. What's, what's wrong with that emphasis? <laughs> well... Yeah, there's a tradition of thinking it's all about motivation. Well, that's one of the three. But the challenge, one of the challenges of being a human being, a real person, is our motivation goes up and down over time. And there is no reliable way for an individual to sustain her motivation or his motivation and keep it really, really high. And so often these things about discipline and willpower (laughs) and Red is to like get you to, you know, somehow keep your motivation super high. Mm. And that's not how it works. Our motivation fluctuates. And so the tiny habits method acknowledges that there's going to be moments when we're not super motivated. And when your motivation drops, you can no longer do hard things. And the only reason you need high levels of motivation is to do hard things. (laughs) And this was the insight. Looking at my own model, you can write it out as B equals MAP, but there's also a graphical version where you map it down X, Y coordinates. And I was looking at the two-dimensional version, and I saw that if you make something really, really easy to do, then your motivation to be high, middle, low, you don't have to keep your motivation high to do it if it's super easy. That then opened the door to then goofing around with my own behavior, my own habits, and making them really, really small. Mm -hmm. And that then led to the tiny habits method. It's like so small that you don't have to rely on motivation. You don't have to have this fantasy. You're going to always be motivated. You Mm -hmm. don't have to be under this pressure that you got to be disciplined (laughs) or have all this willpower. Instead, you design for the reality of you as a real human being in your real life. It's a reliable method because it really works. And Mm -hmm. it's easy to do because you don't have to like wait until you're motivated. Your motivation can be really low and you can still do simple things like floss one tooth, do one push up, pour a glass of water, open a book and read one sentence, not even a whole chapter, just one sentence. Shh. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Don't stop listening here. You'll see how that then opens you up to reading lots of books. Yeah, and, and, and giving yourself permission to, as, as you pointed out, you know, flossing just one tooth and celebrating that, cheesy as that sounds, but but but, but celebrating that and, and being okay with that and, and how that motivates you actually to do more as, as, as you move along, as you continue to do that one tooth or whatever the thing is. Yeah, and, and let me add something here. If I could go back, there's just a few things in the book I would change. And one of them is, so there's this this technique I call celebration in the book. Celebration is how you cause a positive emotion inside yourself. So let's say you want to read more and your tiny habit recipe is after I sit down for my lunch break, I will open my book and read one paragraph. So you know exactly when you're doing it. You know exactly what the the new habit is. It's just one paragraph. It's really simple. Now to wire it in, you do a thing called celebration. You cause yourself to feel a positive emotion. You can say, good for me, or way to go, or just go, yep, I got it done. What I didn't talk about in the book, this is the part that mm, I wish I'd added, is calling that self-reinforcement, because that's what you're doing. You are self-reinforcing. You're making that behavior more automatic, and you're doing it deliberately. The reason, Jeff, I didn't call it self-reinforcement, there's two reasons. One, that term had already been used in the 70s Mm. by academic psychologists for something else. So that term has already been used. Number two, reinforcement is a term from behaviorism. And I didn't want people to think that this is just a new form of behaviorism because it's absolutely not. The behaviorists didn't talk about emotions. They didn't talk about what's going on inside of an organism or a human being, a pigeon, a rat, whatever. So I shied away from calling it self-reinforcement, but that's what you're doing. You are deliberately 
reinforcing, you're creating, you're making it more likely to happen. And it has the added side effect of increasing your motivation. So that's part of the hack of the tiny habits method. You're hacking your emotions, you're self reinforcing. So that opening of the book and reading a paragraph becomes automatic. It doesn't become something you have to decide to do or remember to do. Mm. As soon as you sit down, you open the book and you read a paragraph and you just wire this habit and many, many, many other habits into your life really easily. The better you are at celebration slash self-reinforcing, <laughs> the better you are at that, the faster the habit forms. There is a distinction uh, made early in the book between uh, aspirations and outcomes and behaviors. They're, they're, they're not the, the same thing, although they, all, mm. they get lumped together a lot. Expound on that and why understanding that distinction, BJ, is important. It's a really simple model. So again, I present in the book new models and new methods. It's not old stuff. It's all my original work. And one of them is this simple. You have these three words, aspiration, outcome, and behavior. Aspirations and outcomes are things that you want to achieve. Aspirations tend to be more abstract, like I want better sleep. I want to read more. Where outcomes are things you want to achieve, but they are are more concrete and they're often measurable. I want to sleep eight hours a night. I want to read, you know, two books a week. Those are outcomes. Either one, aspirations or outcomes are great places to start. You can start with, I want to read more or I want to read two books a week. Doesn't matter. Either place. But then it's behaviors that get you there, either to the aspiration or outcome. So aspirations and outcomes are different. They're both good starting points, but then it's behaviors that get you there and often habits. So behavior is a, a broader category and habits a subset, it's a type of behavior. Mm. And so if you create, let's say reading habits in the right way, you will achieve the aspiration of reading more or the outcome of reading two books a week. And people often confuse aspirations with behaviors like, oh, I want to read more. I got to motivate myself to read more. That's a huge mistake mm. because you're focused on the aspiration and you're focused on motivation. And that's what people often do. I got to motivate myself to eat better. I just need more motivation to you know, work harder. Those are dead end paths. That combination of focusing on either the aspiration outcome and motivation just doesn't work reliably. So instead, it's what's the behavior and how do you make that behavior really easy to do. So with tiny habits and more broadly even my work in behavior design, you get really good at figuring out what's the best behavior for me. And I call those golden behaviors. And then how do I make it really easy? And then how do I make sure it happens? The prompt, where does it fit in my life? So it's a radical rethinking in tiny habits in my work more broadly. It's radically, well, in some ways, it's dismissing all the old fashioned ways that didn't work very well, like motivate yourself and, you know, focus on no pain, no gain and these lofty aspirations. And instead, it's really getting down to the nitty gritty of what is the behavior? How do I make it easy? How do I wire it into my life? Mm. Uh, we, we talked at length about motivation, but and, and you hinted at ability and, and prompts. Let's dig into those a little bit more. What are some some methods, BJ, or, or ways we can leverage ability to, to create habits? Yeah. So once you know what your aspiration or outcome is, and I'm just going to say aspiration from now on, but mm. just in your minds, everybody thinks slash outcomes. It can be either one. Once you know what the aspiration is, then you say, well, what behaviors could I do that would get me there? And there's more than one, like, you know, reading more. You could read in the morning. You could read on the bus. You could read in bed at night. You could read over lunch. You could listen to audiobooks on and on and on. So you explore all the different behaviors that could take you to the aspiration. Then you match yourself with a behavior that you think will be effective. It you can do. So that's where ability comes in. Can you actually do it? And then one that you want to do. Don't pick, like if you don't like listening to audiobooks, don't pick that one. <laughs> if you do, pick that one. And then you think, how do I make this really, really easy to do? And in the book, I, I give a step-by-step -step guidance of how to take anything, any behavior type, and break it down and make it really easy to do. In fact, in the back of the book, don't, don't skip over the, uh, <laughs> the stuff in the back, the appendices, Jeff. I give a flow chart, step by step by step by step, so you can take anything and then come up with the tiny version of that. Then that's what you wire in as a habit. And it's not a guess. There's a system. Turns out all of behavior is a system. And that's what really Tiny Habits, my book, is about. Here's this system that you didn't know, but now here it is. And once you see it, it's like, oh. Bam, there it is. And that, it feels on one hand so breakthrough and new. 
And on the other hand, it's so familiar and obvious once you see it. It's sort of like an answer to a riddle. Once you see it, it's like, there it is. How come I didn't know this before? And that's how I felt, Jeff. It's like, oh my gosh, is it really this simple? And there's a system and yeah, and it is. So when you try to make something easy to do, you say, okay, if I'm pressed for time, how do I make it so it's less time? Mm. So rather than read for 20 minutes, if I'm pressed for time, let's say I read for a paragraph. And if even that's too much, one sentence. And there was a time in my life, Jeff, where I was really pressed for time. The habit for reading more was just open the book. That's all I did. (laughs) And then if I wanted to and I could do more, I read more. But the habit was just opening the book. Sometimes it takes too much effort. So let's say you're trying to change how you eat snacks. And if you have to open the fridge, get the cucumber, wash it, chop it up, da, 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 that's too much effort. So what you do is you do all that work in advance. So you just open up the fridge, open up the container, eat the cucumbers or carrots or cauliflower or broccoli or whatever snack you like. So you look at the new habit and you say, what makes this hard? And there's a systematic way of knowing that. And then how can I make it really easy to do? So even when I'm tired, stressed out, discouraged, distracted, I can still do it. I can still open the book. I can still get the cucumbers out of the fridge and eat them, you know? So that's, you're really designing for you at your lowest moment. Mm. So even in the worst of times, you can still do the habit reliably. I like the way you frame that. Even in the worst of times, you can still do it reliably. I I found the appendix quite helpful. I was referring to it throughout my reading, and I also just downloaded before our conversation began the uh, the toolkit uh, that you provide. So I'm looking forward to, yes. to going through that. Can as I well. give another hint? Oh, sure, sure. Outside the book, we created a tiny habits toolkit. It's really good, and it's free. You're supposed to have bought the book to get the toolkit. So yeah, buy the book. But if you can't get the book, just go get the toolkit. Number two, tip, Audible is not going to be happy with me. But I created almost 100 pages. Actually, I worked with a couple people and paid a designer of a set of visuals and graphics that go along with the audiobook. Mm. And I got Audible to put that in front of the paywall. At least I think that's where it is. Mm. You can also go to tinyhabits.com slash audiobook and get it. So yes, you're supposed to buy the audiobook and then they'll get the visual package. But if you can't afford the audiobook, yeah, buy the audiobook. But if you can't, go get the visuals. <laughs> we worked really hard on them and I paid people to produce them. I own that. Audible doesn't own it. It's it's my thing. And so I want to help people. So go get the resources. If you can't afford the book, go get the free resources. If you can afford the book, terrific, but also go get the free resources. Um, you, you call prompts the invisible drivers of our lives. Describe what you mean by prompts in this context and, and how they fit into the overall equation. Well, so much of what we do in our lives, we we do without thinking, and you could call those habits. And there's always a prompt. There's always something that says, do this now. The phone rings, we pick it up. The stoplight turns red, we stop, I hope. <laughs> um, your kid complains, you snap back, okay? So all of those are prompts. And because we do those behaviors without thinking very much, it's the prompts that are in so many ways, driving what we do Mm. every day. And so by paying attention to the prompts, we can get rid of some unwanted behavior. Let's say you don't want to waste, I'll use that word, waste so much time on Facebook. Well, Mm. what's prompting you to go to Facebook? Is it notifications and the email and so on? So if you can take control of the prompts for unwanted behaviors, you can reduce or stop those. And then on the flip side, make sure there are prompts for behaviors you want to do. For example, uh, when the pandemic started, I just realized I needed to be in better touch with my parents, especially my mom. Mm. And so I just said, okay, bam, you're going to create a habit of calling your mom every day or most every day. And for me, it's as I'm headed out to go surfing. So we're living in Maui right now in our Maui home during the pandemic. And so Every morning I surf and then I come back and I work really hard, but the mornings are headed to the ocean and the waves. And so there's a certain point on the way to my surfing spot where I call my mom or my dad. And so I didn't leave that prompt to chance. I associated with when I get to this point on the road, then I tell my phone to call my mom. Then, as a result of that, I'm in pretty good touch with my mom and my dad, and I think that's important. Had I left it just abstract, Jeff, like, oh, I should call my mom more, then there'd be so many nights I'd be getting in bed and go, 
dang, I didn't call my mom. And the next day, dang, I, don't, I didn't call my mom, right? <laughs> so you can, you can design habits into your life. And that's what the tiny habits method is. It's a process for designing habits into your life. And to some extent, designing habits out of your life that you don't want. And, you know, there's motivation, ability, prompt. And by designing the prompts in or out of our life, that's a huge step in getting behaviors to happen, like calling your mom, mm. and getting behaviors not to happen, like wasting time on Facebook. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Much of the book is spent on creating new habits, but there is some time spent on eliminating and stopping bad ones. That is essentially just reverse engineering the model, correct? Yeah, yeah. Now, it's a different process, but all behavior comes back to motivation, ability, prompt. So by using that, and there's a little more to it in the book. And in, in the appendix, there's three pages of flowcharts. Mm. So in fact, I think it's the most systematic and comprehensive way ever to help people get rid of unwanted behaviors mm. ever. And so if I had to pick three pages of the book that I think make the biggest contribution to behavior change, it's those three pages in the appendix. But yeah, and then it's, it's a way of dealing with motivation, ability, prompts, figuring out which part of the bad habit you want to untangle, which one do you tackle first, prompt for that habit, ability, or motivation, and if it doesn't work, what's next, and tons of detail. And in <laughs> fact, Jeff, it's so detailed that my editor and publisher said, no, this can't go in the book. So it's in the appendix. They thought if it went in the actual text of the book, it would just freak people out <laughs> because of the detail and how some people don't like flowcharts. I love systems. I love flow charts, but you know, they're looking at the broader readership. So the point is, yes, it all comes back to motivation, ability, prompt, always. And then there's a systematic way to untangle unwanted behaviors. And now it's in print. Now, now it's here. And I'm just so excited to share, yes, that it's a system, but also the specific step-by-step -step playbook for achieving these kind of behavior outcomes that people want. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the flow charts, for what my opinion's worth, are crucial. So I'm very, very glad that they're included yeah, one way or the other. <laughs> Well, I, I want to finish the conversation about the book by talking about how these behaviors, these habits that we're developing can not only grow, but grow to the point they're impacting people around us or how we can do things that impact yeah. other people's behaviors. And I'm thinking uh, one example that I love from the book is the example of Amy. And you talk about pearl habits and how yeah. her making a decision to change how she responds to something impacted her ex-husband. Yeah. And, you know, all the stories in the book are true. And for me as a scientist, that was really important. It mm -hmm. turns out so many stories you read in books are not true <laughs> or they're composite, like they're mixing different lies. And I was like, no, 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 no. I am a behavior scientist. <laughs> Everything has to be factual. And Amy's and it's actually her real name. There are some of the names we've changed, like Junie's story. Junie, same thing with her vanquishing the sugar monster in her life. Mm -hmm. Same thing. I, I'll hit Junie and then I'll turn back to Amy. So in Junie's story where she realized that sugar had this huge control of, of her and was killing people in her family. Mm. She was able to untangle the sugar habit. And when she did that, what she noticed was she started connecting with her son differently. Her husband started acting differently just as a result of Junie's change. In Amy's case, pearl habits are a type of tiny habit. It's taking something negative and turning it into something positive. And that's why I called it a pearl habit. You have this irritation and you create something of beauty out of it. Mm. And so Amy was able to do that with the relationship with her ex. And every time her ex would insult her, either when she was, you know, handing off kids or somehow coordinating something around schoolwork for their kids, she would use that as a prompt to decide to do something positive for herself. So those insults and attacks really lost, as she tells the story, lost their, their power, lost mm. the stab. Mm. And when she stopped responding in the way that he wanted her to, like negatively, his attacks diminished. And the amazing thing that happened was their relationship actually got better, mm. where they could actually... They both showed up at the, their daughter's graduation party and they were civil and it was fine. And that was something she thought could never happen because the, the divorce and all of that and the battle over the kids was bitter. And so by changing how she responded by using the tiny habits method, it then had an impact on her husband and her child and on and on. And so one way to think about the impact of changes, even if they're tiny, is they have ripple effects. They're not isolated. And 
it turns out that the impact of making these changes, even if they're tiny, is much bigger than people expect. Just like throw a little pebble in the water and look how far the ripples go. Mm. And not only that, then you know the habits will grow and you change how you think about yourself. So there's other ways that tiny is transformative. And going back to the, the seed analogy, you know, say you want a whole garden full of tomatoes. That's what we're doing right now in California. Mm. Well, somebody's doing for us because we're in Maui, but somebody's doing our garden. You just start really small and then they get huge and you're overwhelmed in tomatoes later. <laughs> Same thing with habits, right? So just think of your habits like a tiny little plant and you start the seed, you put it in the right spot and you keep it nurtured. The right seed is what's the right habit. The right spot is what does it come after? And you keep it nurtured by self-reinforcement through celebration. And it blossoms, it grows, and it has these bigger transformative effects. I don't know what it is about me lately, but I was about to share something. And, and as I was thinking about what I was going to share, I'm like, I feel like I've like a broken record. There's been several interviews I've done, BJ, over the last several months where I've at one point in the interview, I've had to say there was this part in your book where I almost cried or where I was brought mm. to tears about something. Mm. And I don't have kids, but boy, if you have teenagers, wait till you get to chapter eight, because the story of Mike and Craig, I mean, Chris. that was just fantastic. Mm. <gasps> That's my favorite story, too. I mean, I like all the stories. But for me, and there's more, a little more to that story. Well, the, the, the setting is this. Here's an adult child who's living at home, and he's really kind of lost his way. And here's the father who's working, who's running a big company from home. And he's super successful, except for with his son and that relationship. And he uses tiny habits to transform the relationship. But what's not in the book is the reason this was so important for the father. Yes, he's an achiever in all sorts of ways, but he had a troubled relationship with his own father. Mm. And to see that perpetuate, I'm getting chills, mm. down to the next generation was just heartbreaking. It was mm. just, oh my gosh, what I swore to myself would not happen is now happening. And he found a way to turn and transform the relationship by using the tiny habits method. And part of that was just simply helping his son feel successful. That's a huge part of the book is help yourself feel successful, help other people feel successful, because that's mm -hmm. the thing that wires and habits changes your identity and so on. That's an important addition to the story that I think it raises the ante. So you can see why for the father, it was so important not to let this continue and to improve the relationship with his adult son. Mm. I've got a couple of questions in the few minutes we have left, BJ, I want to ask you that aren't directly related to the book. But before I do that, anything else from the book you want to make sure that, that we know or walk away with that I didn't ask about? You've asked some great questions. Maybe just this. This book is not about the old-fashioned ways of behavior change. Mm. It's all new stuff. So if you've read books on habits, I've read, no, you've read the old stuff. <laughs> this is the breakthrough. If I could change the subtitle, Jeff, it would be the future of behavior change to make it really clear mm. that this is new stuff. This is not a summary of the old stuff. And it's stuff that I've created, I've tested, I've pulled together. So just... Yeah, this is, if you've read books on habits, that's great. But now, welcome to the future. This is mm -hmm. the most reliable way of doing it. The behavior model is the fundamental foundational model of how behavior works. And I say that because I feel that the insights, the models and methods were given to me by, I don't know how to describe it, some higher power or cause or reason. And I have an obligation to get this out into the world. So I'm not going to be coy about saying it. I mean, this is transformative. It's important. Uh, I have an obligation to share it and to help people. And that's what I'm doing through the book. And that's what I'm doing by talking with you. Hmm. So uh, if you wondered, well, what makes this habit related book different from the others you may have heard of? Now, you know. Thank you, BJ. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of books, what are some books that you've encountered that uh, have left a lasting impression on you over the years? Uh, one, uh, one I, I so like is called Don't Shoot the Dog. <laughs> and it's a dog, it's ostensibly a dog training manual, but it's really not. Well, mm -hmm. it is, but it's, it's, it's a really easy introduction to behaviorism, but it's a super applied. 
and the author Karen Pryor. I think she's great. She's not an academic, but I invited her to be the keynote speaker at an academic conference I was running at Stanford because I feel like her perspective, her hands-on experience is so important. And I really like that book because it really helped me think about you break it down, you make it really simple, you understand the sequences over time. So for Mm -hmm. me, that is a really, really important book. Another book is a book that's been lost and not referenced at all, and it's called Social Learning and Imitation, and it's by uh, Miller and Dullard, and it's from the 1940s. Mm. And this is like, is so interesting and insightful about habits and behavior change, but it got lost. I just stumbled across it, Jeff. I was on Amazon one day and here was this old book and it said (laughs) first edition. I ordered it. It turns out it was the Harvard library copy. Or maybe I got it on eBay. I can't remember. And then I start skimming through and it's like, oh my gosh, the habit loop that people talk about Mm. all the time. Boom, 1940s. Wow. The concepts are in that book and they're not referenced. So there's a lot of gems in that book, including the definition of motivation, the definition of reward, things like that. So there was a rigor there, but somehow that book just has been forgotten. So part of my work is resurfacing it. And then one more in the habit space is chapter four from William James. So 1890s, he published a textbook called Principles of Psychology. It took him 10 years to write it. He was just disgusted with himself. (laughs) But the book became super influential. Chapter four, William James got so many things right, and then a few key things wrong. Mm. But that really lays the foundation for how people have thought about habits for a long, long time. And it's maybe an hour long read, but it's really interesting to read that and see in some ways how much this has become part and parcel of thinking about habits, how much he got right and some things he didn't get right in that book. So those are some of the works that have really influenced me. Mm. Appreciate you sharing those. For those who, like myself, who would love to uh, know more about your programs, I don't know how they've been affected by COVID-19, but uh, share, if you would, about your free five-day program, your certification program, and maybe some aspects of those that can be done online, that sort of thing. Yeah, three opportunities. They're all doable online now. The five-day program in Tiny Habits, I launched in 2011, and it's through that five-day program that I coach thousands of people a year. I stopped counting at 40,000. This is personally (laughs) through email. So now I have a set of certified coaches who actually are on the other side of the emails. You'll be working with Shirley or Amy does it. Um, And and just go to tinyhabits.com, sign up for that. It's free. It's Tiny Habits 101. You know, it's it's like one twentieth of the book, if that. Mm-hmm. Next, if people want to get deeper training and certified, there's a certification program that happens online. It happens once a week for an hour a week for six weeks in a row. Then the third thing for people creating products and services, I call that a boot camp in behavior design. So I teach that to small groups once a month and Jeff, it used to be a two-day intensive mm-hmm. on my at my guest home overlooking the Russian River. But now with coronavirus, we reinvented it to be four sessions. They're on Fridays for four hours. And it's better mm. than the two-day intensive. I didn't think it could be because we've worked for years to make the two-day intensive the best professional training in the world. And we measure it and we keep improving it. And I believe it is. But then doing it through Zoom and doing it remotely and teaching people how to use the methods remotely to create apps or a a culture change program within a company or getting people to eat better vegetables or what have Mm -hmm. you. So we reinvented it. It's on Zoom. And I am just delighted at how well that's going. Now, that one's expensive. Mm. The five-day program's free. The certification's somewhere in the middle. Gotcha. That's great. I'm so glad to hear that turned out the way it did. Well, anything uh, that you didn't share that's ahead for you and your team this year and beyond? Anything you're working on that you're excited about that you didn't already have a chance to talk about? Yeah, briefly. Last year, my class at Stanford was all about reducing screen time. And so Mm -hmm. that project continues in my Stanford lab. And if you go to screentime.stanford.edu, you'll see we brought together, uh, well, on the back end, we have a library of ways to reduce screen time that is bigger than any other collection. So we have Mm -hmm. a tool for that. This year, my class was about using behavior design for coronavirus challenges. And that wrapped up yesterday. My tiny habits coaches have also done work of how do we use tiny habits to help people with challenges 
challenges of coronavirus, whether that's isolation or washing your hands or not touching your face or being productive at home. And then the project that we get to pick up again, because we, we wedged in the coronavirus thing, that class was supposed to be about behavior design for sustainability, mm. saving the planet. But when the coronavirus hit, my TA and I decided we're going to shift. So now the project that I pick up next week and we start again is teaching people to use behavior design for sustainability. Mm. And that's a super important project. So if anybody's involved in that, reach out to me. What we're doing is creating a curriculum that will be free. It's like my boot camp, but it's free because mm. We need to try to save the planet. <laughs> and so we're creating a curriculum and we've run two pilots of this already to help people who are professionals in climate change, climate action to be more effective because mm. they typically don't have any training. So what I try to do in my work is pick the most important problems, screen time, coronavirus, climate change, and then use what I feel has been given me for those huge challenges. And so that's what we're working on. Now, is there gonna be even a bigger challenge come up? Maybe, and if so, we're gonna go after it and we're gonna do everything we can and use the models and methods of behavior design to help people deal effectively. Well, the book again is called uh, Tiny Habits, The Small Changes That Change Everything, or as it will now be known, something akin to Tiny Habits, The Future of Habits. Future. <laughs> <laughs> BJ, this is a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to play a small role in helping uh, get the word out about it. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Plenty of resources to dive more deeply into. I've curated those, and you'll find them at the show notes page I've created just for this episode. That is at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 324 for episode 324. I appreciate your feedback, suggestions, questions, and comments. Write me directly, Jeff, at readtoleadpodcast.com. Like Michelle, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Consulting Surveyors in Australia. She says she is an avid listener and has purchased a number of the books that have been featured here on the podcast. Michelle, I love that you're starting a book club for other business owners and land surveyors. And yes, I would be honored to be your guest at an upcoming meeting. I'll reach out to you to find out more about that. Again, if you'd like to reach me, Jeff at read to lead podcast.com. Next week on the show, we welcome author Emily Hayward. She's written a book called Obsessed, Building a Brand People Love from Day One. We'll follow that the next week with a conversation with Chick-fil-A VP Mark Miller as we discuss his book, Win Every Day, Proven Practices for Extraordinary Results. This is the fifth book in his high performance series and an episode you do not want to miss. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the podcast. Again, when we'll feature Emily Hayward and her book, Obsessed. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Oh, 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 oh,